The Lemhi River meanders for 60 miles through a big valley in this quiet corner of eastern Idaho before it flows into the Salmon River. People driving the Lemhi Valley on Idaho Highway 28 might marvel at the wide open spaces and peaceful bucolic scenes with sprinklers watering hayfields, cattle grazing, and sandhill cranes sounding off in tall grass meadows. Here, local ranchers have been working closely with fish experts and conservation pros for over 25 years to improve fish habitat for salmon and steelhead, migrating fish that travel more than 800 miles from here to the Pacific Ocean. Even before the fish were protected under the Endangered Species Act in the early 1990s, Lemhi ranchers wanted to do their part to save the fish. They remember scores of salmon spawning in the Lemhi when they were kids. Heck, we, I used to come down here and chase fish all the time. I mean, it was, salmon was part of our big deal when we were kids. We used to come down this big pool here, them fat salmon had lodged in here, and man, we'd ride them and chase them and do all kinds of fun stuff. Over the last 25 years, Lemhi ranchers have teamed up with state and federal agencies to create primo spawning and rearing habitat for these magnificent fish. Major milestones include 130 conservation projects and counting, minimum stream flows for fish passage at L6, the main Lemhi River diversion, preserving working lands and open space forever, nearly 30,000 acres of prime spawning areas protected via conservation easements, over 50 miles of riparian fencing, restoring water flows to 12 tributary streams, opening up 50 plus miles of spawning habitat for Chinook salmon and 40 plus miles of spawning habitat for steelhead, installing 110 plus fish screens at irrigation diversions to keep juvenile fish in the river, brokering 50 plus water transactions that restored water to tributary streams and the main Lemhi River. Dozens of water efficiency projects to save precious water for fish, increase crop yields and reduce labor. Replacing 75 plus old irrigation diversions with fish friendly weirs. All this while ensuring that working ranches remain working for the local tax base and economy. Major funding from the Bonneville Power Administration, Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund, Natural Resources Conservation Service, Conservation Organizations, Bureau of Reclamation, Idaho Fish and Game, and many others has been instrumental for the conservation investments. At least an estimated $75 million has been invested in conservation projects basin-wide. Everything starts with the tremendous cooperation between ranchers in the valley and conservation professionals who coordinate projects. All of the conservation work is voluntary. With 90% of the spawning habitat located on private lands, cooperation with landowners is vital. Ledore rancher Merrill Beeler was an early adopter, signing a large conservation easement with the Nature Conservancy in 2010 to protect fish habitat and keep the 2,300-acre family ranch in production as a working ranch. Things that people would have thought 10, 15 years ago impossible, no way it could be done, have been done. Not that many years ago, I'm gonna say, you know, 2010, uh, there was maybe some talk, but a lot of shaking their heads and rolling their eyes because how could you possibly reconnect these tributaries to the main stem of the Lemhi when the waters from those tributaries are essential for ag. And we found a path. And we have not uh, compromised agriculture. That's been a key guiding principle of the Lemhi conservation work since day one. Work to improve fish habitat must also enhance the ranch. That's how we, that's how we approach this whole process is that it should benefit both. Using that approach is multiple sustainable use, whereas you know ag is key in this valley, so we need to protect those interests. We can make it work for both, and I'm convinced of that. We've demonstrated that time and time again. Ralph Swift set the tone in the early 1990s when Snake River salmon and steelhead were protected under the Endangered Species Act 
As the head of the Lemhi Soil and Water Conservation District, he encouraged landowners to be proactive to save the fish. What we're seeing on the Lemhi is the, build, the beginning of a, a real grassroots effort. That's the people who actually live off the grass, livestock operators. They titled the Lemhi Project Model Watershed. They set a high bar, and the effort continues to this day under the Upper Salmon Basin Watershed Program, coordinated by Daniel Bertram and the Governor's Office of Species Conservation Staff in Salmon. A testament to the, the partnerships that have been forged in the Lemhi Watershed is to really earn the trust and respect of the landowners to ensure that they have that trust and that buy-in to plan and implement such large-scale impactful projects that benefit fish and wildlife. The Lemhi River is a key tributary of the Salmon River in Idaho. Historically, the Lemhi was known as one of the most productive spawning streams for Chinook salmon in the Northwest. The Lemhi is thought to be the largest producer of Chinook salmon in the entire Upper Salmon Basin. 20 to 30,000 adults coming back historically to this basin. Now there's a few hundred. Very productive. In the 1990s, their numbers were plummeting. The once legendary salmon runs that used to choke Idaho's rivers during the summertime are plunging toward extinction. Anglers used to catch these impressive lunkers by the dozens. At one time, over 1,700 pairs of Chinook salmon spawned in the Lemhi River in the early 1960s. Last year, however, only 23 pairs spawned in the stream, and this summer, the Lemhi Run may be reduced to single digits. Eight dams and reservoirs on the Snake and Columbia Rivers take their toll on the fish as they move downriver to the sea as juveniles, and then again when they return to Idaho as adults. The fish face many other threats on their journey back to Idaho, hot summer temperatures, predators, fish harvest, and more. 25 years after the ESA listing, Snake River salmon and steelhead have bounced back to some extent, but the numbers of returning adults is still way below the recovery goal of 2,000 returning adults in the Lemhi Basin. It's interesting to note that spawning trends in the Lemhi are tracking very similar to Marsh Creek, the nursery for the pristine Middle Fork of the Salmon River, located in the Frank Church Wilderness. In recent years, 100 to 200 Chinook salmon returned to spawn in the Lemhi. For the many people involved in Team Lemhi, they are doing what they can locally to help the fish. If we look here at the uh, Lemhi Valley and the Lemhi River, 90% of the salmon that spawn in the Lemhi River spawn on private land. And the Lemhi Regional Land Trust with the Nature Conservancy We've protected 95% of the 90% in perpetuity. So those lands and those that stretch of river and the tributaries that come to it are permanently protected. They're going to remain agricultural lands, but we're going to be able to provide uh, the right kind of habitat for the salmon that return and spawn here in the Lemhi. You know, the, the fish have a tremendous challenge ahead of them uh, because of all the obstacles that they face on their long journey from the Pacific to, to get here. What we're doing here with the help of the Fish and Game and uh, the other agencies is to improve this part of the habitat. Uh, we cannot save the whole world, but we will do our best to save and improve our part and hope that other people do the same all, all over uh, the world along the way. Creating minimum stream flows at L6, the main Lemhi River diversion, was one of the most crucial achievements in the Lemhi River Basin. The Idaho Water Resource Board secured the minimum stream flows in 2002 after the river was nearly dried up during spawning season in drought years. The minimum flows are 35 cubic feet per second for juvenile fish passage in the springtime and 25 cubic feet per second when adult fish return in late summer. They've spent millions of dollars trying to keep the minimum stream flow in here. They didn't want any of the agriculture to be messed with. Um, they didn't want people drying up, but they wanted water for the fish. And so everybody pretty much worked together 
The Water Board also has been a vital partner in restoring water flows to six tributary streams via the Water Transactions Program. Over the last 16 years, the program has secured 415 cubic feet per second of water flow through 50 transactions to benefit fish in the Lemhi Basin. Sager has a major balancing act to serve hundreds of irrigators and the fish, but he loves his job. I've been chased by a little old ladies with brooms when I tell them I'm taking their water to, you know, being threatened to be shot once, but, you know, nothing's ever happened. Idaho Fish and Game's screen shop ensures that the major diversions are screened to keep fish in the river. And the Bureau of Reclamation has replaced many old irrigation diversions with fish-friendly diversions to boost fish survival. Water conservation projects in the Lemhi Basin also help save precious drops of water. Water is definitely the lifeblood of our uh, watershed here, and so agriculture in general is the lifeblood of our community. Um, subsequently, agriculture is the largest or one of the largest users of surface and groundwater within our watershed. And so therein lies the challenge, but also the opportunity. Switching from flood to pivot irrigation can reduce water consumption from 30 to 60 percent and improving the efficiency of sprinkler systems can save 10 to 13 percent, she says. Irrigation pipelines also save water. Many local ranchers have tapped into NRCS programs to save water and increase yields. When you look at the projects that we've done over the years in the Lemhi Basin, that cumulative effect is pretty impressive. Increases yields, which equates to higher land values and overall long-term sustainability of their working lands. Reith, an Idaho native, really enjoys being part of Team Lemhi. For all of us, you know, we all have the same goals and, and we all love this place for very similar reasons. The roots run really deep here. Um, we love the landscape, we love the people, um, we love the opportunity it provides for us, and we're just all so invested in it. Nikos Monios and his wife Valerie are major players in the Lemhi conservation effort. They have donated conservation easements on 5,500 acres of their private land to the Lemhi Regional Land Trust to ensure the Eagle Valley Ranch remains open space and a working ranch forever. Uh, these conservation easements are uh, voluntary transactions where a landowner uh, gives up part of his ownership rights, in, a, in essence the right to develop the property, subdivide the property, uh, do certain activities like mining, the land trust which uh, holds them in uh, perpetuity. Not only we, but future owners are bound by these uh, agreements. The conservation easements donated by the Eagle Valley Ranch provided a big boost to the Lemhi Regional Land Trust early on. By doing a very large conservation easement, which is still the largest uh, easement they've done in their history and the largest donated easement, uh, we would give them uh, credibility and uh, momentum. And the second thing uh, we wanted to do is set an example. The local land trust uh, has uh, been very active and very productive in getting other landowners uh, the help that they need to achieve similar objectives. More recently, the Lemhi Regional Land Trust inked a big conservation easement with Carl Tyler, preserving 10 miles of fish habitat and 4,682 acres along the Lemhi River. To date, we have 14 conservation easements. Um, a little over 14,000 acres of land, uh, working lands are conserved. Um, and amazingly, over half of those um, were donated conservation easements, um, which really, I think, harkens to um, the confidence that those landowners have um, in conservation in the valley. People here in this valley are special. They care about these lands, they're connected to these lands, whether it's they're here one generation, 
um, or if they've been here for five, ten generations since the 1800s. They really have a distinct um, care and stewardship for these lands and they want to see them conserved. They want to see the fish uh, come back. They want to see uh, you know, the cattle working alongside all of the people who are living here too. So it's very, very special ties for them. Younger generations of Lemhi ranchers are also embracing the conservation ethic. Thane Cower with McFarland Livestock saved five cubic feet per second on Holly Creek, a Lemhi tributary stream, by converting an old open irrigation ditch to a buried pipeline. He eliminated pumping costs by converting to a gravity system and increased crop yields too. I think it's better. This system is cleaner, easier to run. Uh, just all around more efficient for sure. I think it's important to uh, work together so that uh, the whole river ecosystem will uh, work. We make little changes with each, each one of these projects, but I think in the, in the long run it's going to have a, a bigger effect, you know, down the, down the stream for years to come. Most recently, Nikos Monios provided 2.5 miles of Lemhi River bottomlands to Idaho Fish and Game to create more overwintering habitat for juvenile salmon and steelhead. This project in particular is, is in an area that we've identified very, is very important for uh, winter survival of Chinook salmon and steelhead, and we've actually documented very low survival rates for this area of the river because of that lack of habitat and we call it habitat capacity. And so this project was essentially to try to take some of that back, if you will. So we were you know, trying to build different treatments in that would provide you know, sufficient quality habitat to meet these life stages needs. And the whole, the whole idea is to try, to try to increase the survival and get as many fish out to the ocean as we can. With design professionals, Delusia re-engineered the course of the Lemhi River to slow it down, provide more natural curves and meanders in the stream, and cold, deep water habitat to create more ideal overwintering habitat for salmon, steelhead, and resident fish. Historically, the river had been straightened to make room for the railroad and highway. Research showed that creating better overwintering habitat for fish was vital in the lower Lemhi Basin for increasing juvenile fish survival. In straightened sections of the stream, overwintering survival ran only 10%, compared to a potential of 60%. We feel like we're stewards of the land for 20, 30 years, whatever the good Lord gives us. Uh, and uh, we will do our best to take good care of it while we own it and uh, leave it in a better condition than we found it for future generations. Team Lemhi works on about 10 to 15 projects a year in coordination with the Upper Salmon Watershed Project. 21 state, federal and local agencies have a seat at the table. And it's not all just about salmon, steelhead and resident fish. Some projects also improve habitat for sage-grouse, songbirds, and other wildlife species. Conservation projects also have been creating new jobs for local contractors and jobs for salmon teenagers engaged in the Lemhi Youth Employment Program. It's important to ranchers to see the conservation work enhancing the community, providing a livable wage for young professionals. We want to make sure that whatever project or whatever we was doing, at the end of that, that the community would be in a better place. That has built the opportunity for young families who wanted to come back to the valley to build businesses that are enhanced by the conservation projects and restoration enhancement projects that we do in the valley. And that's been huge for our community Ultimately, the story about Team Lemhi is about community. It's about relationships, building trust. There's a strong culture of trying to make things better for fish, wildlife, the local economy, and the community. Lemhi rancher Bruce Mulkey has spent half of his life on the Model Watershed Project. I'm, I'm proud that we tried to do something. I don't know whether it's been successful or not. Maybe 100 years from now we'll know. But but as much money as they've dumped into it, they could have built a canal all the way to the ocean, had sorting gates on it. 
put whatever fish wanted to go where and just send them. The good, good part about the whole thing, there's a pretty good relationship between the government agencies and the landowners. A good bunch of people here, you know, and I consider a lot of them pretty good friends. Mulkey remembers speaking to an American Fisheries Society meeting in Montana. He was the only landowner in a room full of hundreds of fish biologists. Afterwards, I got mobbed and, well, how did you get that going? I said, you guys will go into the community and look around and get to know some people. There's going to be people there that are going to agree with you, but if you go in and try to shove it down their throats, they're going to run you off or they won't cooperate at all. This one is special. Uh, landowner support in general is critical to what we do. Again, this is a voluntary program. Without landowner participation, we couldn't do what we're doing, period. I mean, that's the bottom line. 